Welcome to season eight of the Life Giver Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Weathers. I'm a military spouse, clinician, and leadership coach. And Life Giver is where I get to spark honest conversations, interview experts, and encourage you with topics on military culture, marriage, and leadership. So give yourself permission to pause and lean in. There's something for everyone here. to season eight of the Life Giver podcast. I cannot believe we are in season eight. Every year I get to the end of the season and I think there's nothing left to talk about. And then we get through the holidays and winter and it gives us all a chance to think and process. And then you realize there is so much we could still talk about. So if you have been following me on the podcast since the beginning or even have taken the time to go back and listen to some previous episodes from other seasons, thanks for coming back. Um, my name is Corey. If you're new, I'm a military spouse. I'm also a mental health clinician. I am a coach. And yes, there is a difference between the two. And I'm also a consultant. So what that means is specifically for the military culture, um, I love studying it and I'm in it and I'm part of the tribe. And so I like to help businesses um, and organizations understand the culture better. And I help, I, I like to help leaders understand the culture a little bit. You would be surprised how many of us think we understand this tribe um, only to find out there's a, so much more that we could be learning. And so over the last 15 years, having a chance to serve so many of you, to do um, individual sessions and couples sessions, um, coaching and doing strengths coaching, and then of course, traveling around and speaking on various topics um, has been a wonderful ride and given me the opportunity to really get to know the ins and outs of this culture, whether you're enlisted or whether you're officer, whether you're in leadership or not. Um, and it's also given me the chance to travel around and when I feel like there's a theme or something that's going on in the culture, sometimes it comes from an individual session, something comes up and then I hear it again in another session, or then I go and do a speaking event and they're talking about it there too. Um, that's one of those times that I, I think to myself, hmm, there is a theme or a topic that's stirring within the culture and I'm going to pay attention to that and maybe even take um, not the intimate personal details that I'm hearing in sessions, but just the topic, um, taking that, you know, to other circles to test out, is this a topic that's just, you know, this individual or this couple? Is it just here at this one installation or is this culture wide? And so it really gives me the opportunity to really get a better idea of what's happening in our culture. So I've done that. Um, and that's where some of the topics come from, like we're going to talk about today um, for the podcast. And um, it's also what gives me ideas of how to best serve you. So if there's ever kind of a theme that's popping up in your conversations or something you've been thinking about, I would love for you to shoot me an email and let me know kind of what you've been thinking about or what you're seeing wherever you are, because you never know if it's something that a lot of other people are struggling with. So, um, so welcome to the newest season. Um, you guys hopefully know by now that every season I take, um, I take it as like a creative opportunity to try something new and that maybe drives some of you guys crazy who <laughs> like consistency. But for me, I, I think I consider myself a creative. And so I love the idea of every season, trying something new, changing up the intro music, um, thinking about what I want this season to look like and feel like, and if there's different topics to cover. Again, how is the culture shifting? And so how can this podcast shift too? And so thank you for those of you who stick with me, <laughs> even through all of those changes. Hopefully you know me a little bit better by now that you never know what to expect. So. Um, this season, season eight, is going to be um, definitely about marriage because that's what you guys um, like to hear about is different marriage topics. But I really wanted this season to also address leadership. Um, there's a lot of you, whether you are a spouse or um, a service member, that you are in positions of leadership. I think personally, we are all in positions of leadership. You can think about that and how it relates to your parenting or in your volunteer role or at work, or maybe you are 
are just beginning and you want to become a leader and you're looking for mentoring. So I think leadership is super important. And it's um, lately I've had the opportunity to expand these the teaching and the training opportunities that I provide to expand to leadership. So it's not just marriage retreats. It's not just Strength Finder. But in the last, I'd say, year and a half, maybe two years, I've actually been doing what I call the Leading Generations Training, where I um, have been studying the culture for like the last 15 years and watching these different shifts that were happening because of the different generations coming in. So I'm Gen X. Um, there's the millennial gen- generation that came in after us. They came in around 9-11, maybe a little bit after that. And then of course, Gen Z is filling our ranks now. And so there's a lot of differences between those generations. And so I was watching those shifts um, over the last 15 years and how it was impacting um, how our culture does life, everything from social events to what was working, what was not working. And if you haven't noticed, we have a huge recruiting problem right now with Gen Z. Um, We're also having some huge issues with social events and our culture changing how we um, do community, how we encourage each other. Um, And a lot of that has also shifted with social media coming coming on the scene and just all the shifts that we've gone through since 9-11. So that was something that I was kind of storing up in my heart and my mind for the last 15 years. And... I realized in the fall that I was ready to write a book on it. So I um, thank you to all of you who've been patient waiting for this season to come out. I'm um, I'm kind of a one man show. And so I couldn't write this book and also put out the podcast at the same time. This book took every bit of energy. Um, I, I feel like I went into a tunnel or almost went into a deployment. That's what Matt would say. Um, and I could not have done it without him and without the understanding of our two boys, um, because it was a lot of deep think. Um, and all I'm going to say about the book is this. It is the best way I can explain it. It is the story or the analysis of our culture, the military tribe over the last two decades of war. So if you have spent any amount of time during those two decades of war, or if you're just coming in and trying to understand the generations that went through two decades of war, um, I felt like what was missing was an authentic story, an authentic telling of what our culture went through during those two decades and why we came out on the other side, not only exhausted, but burned out and now struggling with those um, recruitment and retention issues. So um, I won't give away all the details and you probably don't want to hear about all those details, but that's where I've been. Um, I made a goal for myself to turn it in by Easter, that first draft of the manuscript, and I turn it in at 1130 at night on Easter. Um, in those last two paragraphs, I was literally getting tendonitis in my hand and two fingers was were not working. I was trying to type with two fingers that wouldn't work. Like it was like I was barely crossing the finish line. So um, I rested for a few days and knew I was just ready to get out season eight um, and get us started because I have some fantastic guests um, that are coming in season eight. So we're going to talk all about that. Um, more on the book to come. In fact, I have some really exciting things um, that will come when it's time to talk about book launch and um, how you can be a part of that. And as always, if you're interested in any of those trainings, please reach out to me. You can find me at coreyweathers.com. Okay. So some of you might be asking, if you listen to season seven, last season, you might be asking, where is Sarah? Um, I love Sarah. Sarah and I are still great friends. No problems with Sarah. Um, We talked before this season launch. And um, as you guys listened and heard last season, she is a busy homeschool mom, right? Like she also works on a homestead. And um, she also was doing such an amazing job helping me organize my life. And so I'm so grateful for so many people who've been in my life along the way that have helped me not only stay organized, but um, help me just do this thing of serving this tribe. And so um, Sarah and I um, both agreed, and she felt like she really just wanted to devote some extra time to her kids and to the homestead. And so I know she, um, I'll have her back on the podcast for sure, but there's no issues. We just decided this was a season for her to focus on what was really important. And honestly, that's what season seven was all about. And so I'm just so grateful for her friendship and for her help. And um, and in doing so, and her really, um, and it's actually a really good moment to encourage you guys out there that 
Sometimes healthy boundaries and speaking your truth feels scary, but most people love knowing what you need uh, and how they can support you. So when Sarah was like, I think I just need to focus on my family, I was like, awesome. Um, I love that. That's what we were talking about all last season. So uh, maybe some maybe somebody out there listening needs to hear that reminder that if that's something that you need to do and that you need to ask for um, better, you know, whether it's boundaries or to saying no to something on your plate, um, that that's okay. You got to do you, right? So um, I, it made me think about Jennifer Hamrick, another great friend of mine. I hope you're listening, Jennifer. Uh, she's been a great friend for a really long time, and she had also stepped in for um, a couple years ago and was also helping me organize myself. And she was such a blessing until she actually wrote an amazing book on adoption. Um, I need to put that in the show notes. Um, and she also took a break so that she could focus on her family. And so I'm just so grateful for all the people who've helped me. This is a village mindset, um, life giver is. And so um, it gives me the opportunity to give a huge, huge shout out to a company called Squared Away. It is a military spouse owned business that trains up military spouses as executive assistants. And I reached out to formally bring on an executive assistant to Life Giver. Um, I've done such a great, I've had such a great time having Sarah and Jennifer helping me out um, along the way, but I knew it was time to really um, get some help. And so I'm so glad to have Amelia from Squared Away on my team now, officially. Um, and Squared Away is phenomenal. Um, if you are looking for an assistant and also a way to help another military spouse out in their employment, um, Squared Away has the ability to not only train up spouses to become vir- not just virtual assistants, but executive assistants with all of the skills that they need um, to really take small businesses and other larger businesses to the next level. Um, And you don't get just an executive assistant, you get a whole team. And so I'm going to put the link for Squared away in the show notes as well. So if you are interested in, um, in finding an assistant or becoming one, um, reach out to them and and mention my name. Um, Hey, we get, we get like credit for, Pass it, like paying it forward. And so please mention my name um, and you can help Life Giver out as well. So um, super excited to have the help um, and always grateful to have the help. So that's where Sarah is. That's where Life Giver is at this point. Um, book, you know, more information to come on that. Um, so let's talk about season eight and what is coming for season eight. So um, here's what's going to happen that's a little bit different um, other than us covering the topic of marriage and leadership. Um, I'm going to put out, and I've done this in a previous season before, and everybody seemed to really appreciate it, where I'm going to push out interviews and topics in series. So the podcast is still going to come out every first and 15th. Um, so you can expect the next, um, episode should be May 1st. This one's coming out on April 15th. Um, but it's going to come out with like, um, the next several episodes are going to be a part of a series and then they'll continue to come out every first and 15th, but we're going to do, um, a marriage intimacy series here first, which I am super excited about. I have some amazing interviews that are coming. So please, if you have not subscribed to this podcast, please do, because I want to make sure that you are notified, um, that these episodes are coming out and that you see them. Um, If you are not on the newsletter, there's a link in the show notes to subscribe to the newsletter where you can also, we're going to be putting out one newsletter for every series. So you're not going to get monthly um, or even weekly newsletters. We're just going to send out a newsletter that says, hey, the next series is starting. Here's all the episodes coming and here's some resources about it. So for example, this past week, um, we sent out a Life Giver newsletter that said the intimacy series, not only is the season eight launching, but the intimacy series is launching. Here are the interviews. Here's the links where you can purchase some of the books that are mentioned. Here's some extra books, the extra resources that we would recommend. And also here is some additional content um, related to the intimacy series. And so you get this really great newsletter with everything you could possibly think of um, attached in that newsletter in case you're looking for more resources. So We are starting the series of intimacy, and this is a topic that so many couples struggle with. 
when we talk about what are the top three issues that cu- that couples bring into counseling, it is usually um, sex, uh, finances, and sometimes it's either like external family members um, or it could be job related. So um, we are going to cover the topic of um, sex and intimacy over the next couple of episodes. And so just just as a heads up, not so much today, but in the follow-up episodes, if you're going to listen to it while you're in the car or when the kids are around, make sure you put your earbuds in. We're covering some sensitive material. So coming up in the next episode, if you were part of the Independent Wellness Summit, I think it was two summits ago, actually, I interviewed Shanti Feldhan. You've probably heard me talk about Shanti. She's one of my favorite authors um, and marriage experts. She has an analytical researcher kind of mindset. And her passion, both her and her husband, their passion is to take a look at what are the biggest issues that couples struggle with and then go and research it. So instead of just writing about her opinion on it or or even, I mean, she does write about her conclusions, but she really goes out into the world and interviews um, couples to find out what do couples experience, what do they say, what do they struggle with, and really find the terminology that is mo- most helpful to all of us. Uh, you probably have heard me mention her in talking about her research where she went out to find the happiest couples she could find. And ask them a series of questions. But one of the questions that was one of my favorite was I'm trying to figure out what was the one thing that she could narrow down that they did that kept their marriage strong and also happy. And what she found from that research was that couples who believed that their spouse had the best intentions, they were the couples that did the best, that were the healthiest, and they were also the happiest. And that, I've never forgotten that. And so when I do counseling or coaching, we talk about that sometimes, that so often conflict, we think our spouse is trying to hurt us, that they have malicious intent, they meant to hurt us, when what Shanti has found in her research is that... um, it does so much that we're most of us are not trying to hurt our spouse. Like we're really trying to get it right. And if you can believe that about your spouse, you'll do so much better. Um, you probably have also heard me talk about her books for women only, for men only. Um, they're my favorite books to recommend to couples that are really looking to just get on the same page quickly. Um, they're short, easy reads, and the and the way that they're titled for women only is a book for women to read about men and her research about what men said about how they understand love and how they receive love and how they hear love. Um, There's a chapter on sex in there about men and how they feel about that. But then there's a follow-up on For Men Only – written by her husband um, about women. And so when I tell couples to read those books, I actually tell them, read the book that is about you first, make notes in it, and then swap them and read them as you're supposed to, because it really does help um, really cut to the chase and give your spouse the right information so that they're not reading a book and guessing, you know, is this how my spouse feels? Like they see your notes in there, they see where you underline and say, that's me. Um, So those those are some of my favorite books. So the next episode is my interview with Shanti Feldhan, where um, we are talking about her new book that she co-authored with one of my other favorite um, podcast guests, Dr. Mike Seitzma. You probably have heard his name before. Um, they co-wrote a book called, Seek, uh, let's see, Secrets of Sex and Marriage, um, where Shanti did the research, well, they both did. Um, but you really get Shanti's perspective on the analytics and what the research says. And then Seitzman also looks at that research, but he brings the clinical side of what he sees in his practice. And so I'm going to interview Shanti where she's going to really dive into what she thought about and saw in the research and in the writing of that book. And then I'm going to have a follow-up episode with Seitzma where he also shares his thoughts and what he's seeing in his clinical practice on what couples understand or misunderstand the most in their marriage when it comes to sex and intimacy. So do not miss those um, upcoming episodes with Shanti Feldhan and Dr. Mike Seitzma. 
Um, and then I'm going to have Dana Gresh. She is a writer and an author and a speaker who has done a lot of work for actually young women and young girls, adolescent girls, and building up their self-esteem. But she recently came out with a book called Happily Even After, um, where she talks about overcoming or healing um, from restoring her marriage with her husband, Bob, um, after his struggle with pornography. And um, it is a fantastic book. And uh, I did an interview with her. And so we're going to talk about pornography. And so if that is an issue that your marriage struggles with, I highly encourage you to listen to that episode, maybe even pick up Dana's book before we get to that episode, um, because there's a lot of great stuff and it's honest and it's helpful. Um, and I think she does a really great job covering everything from how do you set boundaries? How do you offer grace. That's usually a topic that's really difficult with couples who have betrayal issues of how do I express and communicate my frustration and my um, even my anger when now my spouse is trying to heal things. Um, what if your spouse is not trying to heal things and restore the relationship? Um, she covers forgiveness. I mean, it's a whole bunch of stuff. And so obviously we couldn't get to everything in the book in the interview, but highly recommend that you pick up her book and then that interview is coming out. So after that series, um, we'll launch into obviously a couple um, of episodes where I will talk about different topics and then we'll go into a leadership series um, where I've got some other great guests that I will tell you about soon because I don't want to overload you today on the first episode. So lots of great stuff that's coming and I'm super excited about it. Um, so again, uh, the episodes come out every 1st and 15th of each month. And um, and as always, please reach out to me, send me an email, um, reach out and let me know what you're liking or what topics you'd like to have covered. It always makes a huge difference to hear what you're liking or what you're missing from other podcasts that you're listening to and um, what information you want coming at you. So today... Um, <clears throat> I thought that it would be good to talk about um, a topic that is coming up a lot in the last year or more in some of my sessions, but also came up in the interviews that you're going to be listening to with um, Shanti and Dr. Mike and Dana. Um, and that is the topic of um, what does it mean to manage my spouse? Now, this was a topic that I covered a little bit last season um, with my interview with my Aunt June, where I first brought up this idea of what does it mean to manage someone. If you if you heard that episode, we talked about um, how my aunt said to me one time, you know, Corey, you can't manage that relationship into place. And I really loved that sentence. Um, and it's always stuck with me since. This idea of how we manage, and I think it kind of launched me into a season of really looking for and examining my own life. Where do I find myself managing Matt or managing my kids? And so I'm going to unpack what that means a little bit and maybe hopefully inspire you guys to maybe look for it in your own life. I honestly think it's in every relationship, especially intimate relationships. So I have a feeling almost everybody listening to this could probably benefit from hearing it and also trying to practice some of the things that we're going to talk about. So um, today's topic then is... Um, when to when you are managing or identifying when you're managing your relationship versus when you are actually being a help and um, what I would call being a helpmate in your relationship. So I think that when we all get married, what we really want to do, and this again, I think we could apply to our kids too. I think in a, the relationships that we really care about the most, I think what we really want to do is to help that person because we love that person. Um, we find opportunities to serve them. We um, get to know their personality. We get to know when do they get frustrated? Um, when do they struggle with different behaviors? And so out of an act of love, we want to help them and serve them. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say if a husband is coming home, I'm going to use a stereotype for just a minute, but if, if a husband is coming home and they have a tendency to come home from work and they're frustrated, maybe they have some toxic leadership at work. 
um, and they come home. And because of that toxic leader leadership, they're coming home really frustrated, really irritable, and that's starting to kind of leak in the household. What can happen after a duration of time is his wife can get to a place where because it's creating some frustration or tension in the home, she might start to kind of walk on eggshells because maybe he's more irritable than usual and she doesn't want to set him off. Even if she knows it has nothing to do with her, um, out of a desire to be nice and serve him and not further frustrate him, or what we eventually find after a while is out of finding her own peace um, and keeping like a household status of peace or keeping the household calm, she will change her own behavior, change her own interaction with her husband in order to manage his mood, right? So maybe she had a rough day too, um, but she tells herself, because I love him, because I want um, because I want him to not be frustrated when he comes home, because I want him to feel like he can have a home that is peaceful when he comes home to, which is all wonderful, loving, um, amazing motives and intentions, that starting from that, she starts to change her own behavior and kind of maneuver around him. Um, that's fine at first, but what happens is if we never address what's going on with him at work. And he's always coming home in that irritable state. And she's always kind of bending around that. What ends up happening is she starts to really stuff down her own needs and is not bringing up, hey, I'm having a hard time at home and I need you to kind of take a turn here. Um, And if she's always kind of finding ways to change her own behavior in order to manage his behavior, she's getting into, or let's say she's getting out of being a helpmate, and into managing the relationship. Um, Let me give you another example. We'll kind of flip things around for a second. So we'll flip the stereotype for just a minute. Again, stereotypical example. Um, I'm not thinking of anybody in mind. I'm just using stereotypes to keep it easier. But let's say in this case, it is a wife who um, is really unhappy with her life. She's struggling with a sense of purpose. Maybe she's struggling to have a job. Does that sound familiar? Um, and so she's really finding herself in a place in a, in a season of being unhappy. And out of that, out of feeling out of control of her life, she um, is just also really irritable, right? And she is resentful. And out of that um, is really irritable and maybe angry. And let's just even say she's kind of nagging towards her spouse, towards her husband. And so when he comes home from work, let's, again, stereotypes here. I know we have dual service. I know we have spouses that work out of the home. So I'm just using stereotypes. Please forgive me. So I hope you can apply this to your life either way. But if he is um, around the house and she is nagging in a very negative way and is um, really picking on him and he's starting to feel like he can't do anything right, you know, what would be healthy would be for him to eventually bring that up and say, hey, I'm feeling like I can't do anything right and you've been really upset with me for a really long time. Um, And I'd like to change the dynamic between the two of us. That would be healthy. But instead of doing that, he starts to tiptoe around the house. Um, Maybe he just either goes to one extreme where he is just not going to help at all and he just kind of disconnects around the house. Or maybe he goes the other extreme and he starts doing everything he can to get it right and so that she won't complain, right? So either extreme is really him trying to change her behavior and change her mood with his behavior, right? So we're managing her mood instead of assertively with kindness, bringing up the problem, talking about the problem. We are instead using our behavior almost in a passive way or a passive aggressive way to manage their behavior and keep them calm. That's where we get out of a healthy kind helpmate role and into a managing role. Let me give you one more example. Some of you guys are parents and some of you are parents of um, toddlers or kids that are really having a difficult time in their life, dealing with anger issues, 
outbursts, toddler tantrums. Um, maybe you have a teenager that's really struggling and they're having angry outbursts. You can really find yourself as a parent feeling out of control of your own home and again, walking on eggshells. Or maybe you're changing um, how you bring up what would be honestly healthy parental conversations or teaching conversations or mentoring conversations that you should be having because it is your role as a parent to teach your children. But because of the constant tension and stress and drama in the home um, and the outbursts that make you feel out of control, you change and become more passive um, or passive aggressive in your parenting style out of fear that it's going to cause a disruption in the home or an outburst in the home. And we start like kind of dancing around that person or that, um, that relationship to manage them, to keep them calm. And so really what we're talking about when we are talking about managing these relationships is when you think about it, we are using our behavior to manage someone else for our sake, for our own sense of peace. And so instead of asking in an assertive, kind way for what we're needing the home to feel like, um, to the way that we need the home to run and asking for that, um, and honoring the thing that is happening within our body that says something's wrong here, that instead of listening to that, we use our behavior to bring a sense of peace into our own skin and our own body and in our own experience. And we're going to manage them so that we feel better, right? So when you think about it, managing the other person is really not fair to you because you are not being honest with yourself and you're not listening to your body and to your mind and to your heart that says something needs to change. And it's also not respectful and it's also not, um, it's not helpful to the other person that we're not being honest and that we are using our behavior to manage them for, again, our own sake of peace. And so what we want to do is change that behavior and first of all, identify it and figure out where am I managing other people? If you have done the strength finder, um, I find that people with the strengths of empathy and harmony, uh, some of those relationship builders especially, but I would even say if you have the strength of um, de uh, deliberate, where you are constantly seeing the risks around you, right? So if you are one of those people that methodically, slowly makes decisions, like I always give the example for deliberates. Like if you go into the garage and you say, today is going to be the day that I um, clean out the garage and you go out there and it's overwhelming to you and you don't know where to start because all you can see is if I start there, then there's going to be consequences over there. And if I start over here, then I'm going to not have the space to organize the things that need to go over there. And so you get so paralyzed with all the things that could go wrong, you just don't do anything at all, right? So that's that's what we call a deliberate strength. Um, so you can hear that when you think about a relationship where you are worried about all the things that are going to go wrong, you are going, your strength is going to kind of tell you, hey, too many things could go wrong here, so let's avoid everything we can that can make things more complicated. But I also see it with people who have the strength for empathy or harmony, empathy being that you value the emotions of other people. So in this case, if you are managing the other person out of a sense of empathy, it's coming from like what you feel like is like a really nice, kind, loving perspective where it's where you're thinking about the other person's feelings and I don't want them to be irritable and I want them to be at peace and I want them to have a good relationship with the kids and I want them to be okay. And, and you're so being thoughtful about the other person's emotions. And those emotions are so much part of the equation that instead of the other person managing their own emotions and asking for change or doing something different or adjusting their own emotions or having an emotion, and maybe that's okay too. They are just allowed to have an emotion that makes you uncomfortable. Um, instead, you start doing all the work for them. So that's where we see empathy starting to manage someone else or manage the relationship. And, and it and a lot of people with empathy have a very hard time seeing where they're managing people because they've always been taught or they've always thought that being considerate of someone else's feelings is a loving thing to do. 
And it is unless you are not allowing the other person to have their feelings or you're trying to fix their feelings for them or you're trying to create the perfect space so they have the feelings that you want them to have. You can hear how that's more about you centric instead of that actually valuing the emotions that they're having as a valuable um, part of the equation. Um, Giving one other example, people with the strength of harmony have the talent to bring people together. So almost similar to deliberate, but with a different motivation, people with the strength of harmony are going to kind of rush in and try to heal the relationship too quickly. Um, And we see that when couples especially need to have conflict and there needs to be a disagreement or um, if the other person really has had a bad day and they need the, the safety to be in a space where they can appropriately have a bad day, if we're rushing in to heal the relationship or rushing in to reduce the tension and they don't feel like they have the freedom or the safety to have an emotion, then you can hear how that harmony is not being used as a helpmate or as a gift to the relationship. We're again, using that strength or that gift for our own benefit. So I always say with the Gallup strengths that um, we know if we're, we're using them from a superhero stance, if we are using them for good to serve others, obviously not to a fault or an extreme, but if we are using them for self or selfish gain, Um, that is us using our strengths as a villain. Because remember, the only difference between a superhero and a villain is how they use their strengths or how they use their superpowers. One uses it for good, the other uses it for self. So anytime we are using it for our own benefit um, and not giving the other person the chance to adjust or Maybe it's one of those times that it's okay for them to have an emotion, right, where we might be using it for self. So hopefully that's um, making um, sense. I find that a lot of people who are trying to identify when they might be managing versus trying to identify when they're doing something that is loving and kind and actually being a helpmate is, is really hard at first to figure out, is this a moment where I'm managing or is this a moment where I'm actually helping in a good way? So I would say, here's, let me give you some examples of being a helpmate so that as you go into your relationship and into the world and think about, um, you know, what's the difference, you can maybe look for it this way. So I would define a helpmate being a time when you are genuinely helping the other person when one, they have asked for that help. Obviously, you're helping them, and they've identified how you can help. And so that is a good example of being a helpmate. Um, if you're unsure that you ask them, is this something that you that I can help you with? Let's say your spouse comes home irritable. Um, is there anything that I can do for you tonight that would help you find some peace, right? So for example, let's use the stereotype again. Let's say you were... Um, spouse comes home and they have been um, just over sensory all day with lots of people talking, uh, maybe even yelling. It's just been a really um, overstimulating day. And now they're coming home and the kids are having a hard time and he just, he or she just needs some time to decompress, right? Um, if they come home and they say, you know what, I just need 30 minutes. Yes, that would be so helpful if I could just get 30 minutes of quiet to recenter and transition back into being a wife or a father or whatever, then that's, I think, a great opportunity to be a helpmate. Um, it's, It's also okay for you to say to your spouse, hey, is this something that you would like some help with or do you just need some time to yourself to figure it out? What we're doing here is we're actually giving them the choice to work on it themselves have that emotion if they need to have it, or ask for help, right? Now, if they're asking for help and it's like a never-ending, the house always needs to be quiet, then that's an unrealistic ask, right? Um, And maybe we do that for a season or for a certain period of time, but at some point there needs to be a conversation that it's, um, that I need to honor myself and I need to talk with you about it and say, hey, like, 
I, I understand this is what you're asking for, but it's not realistic for me to be able to provide it every time without abandoning some part of myself in the process, right? Like um, to do something every day that feels so unrealistic, it might be too much for me to be able to offer um, or help you with. And so we've got to come up with another plan. I hope that what you're hearing really in all of this of managing versus helpmate, um, that what you're hearing is inviting honesty into the relationship, um, inviting truth speaking into the relationship, but not from an aggressive place. So at no point is it healthy for any of us to do character assassination, calling each other names, like screaming at each other, raising our voice in a way that is demeaning or minimizes the other person that is abusive, um, that is emotionally abusive or hurtful. Like that is not truth speaking. That is aggressive. Okay. Um, if we swing the pendulum to the other side, passiveness is abandoning yourself um, and allowing someone else to run over your rights to have thoughts, feelings, opinions, um, or ask for change even. And so if you are not either bringing it to the table um, and you are denying yourself of the opportunity to speak the truth, then you're doing it to yourself, right? If someone else is saying you don't have a voice, that would be aggressive towards you. And so if we are swinging the pendulum to the other extreme and we are passive and we're not bringing it up, then I find with a lot of people who are trying to figure out, like, when do I speak up? When do I not speak up? When do I um, set boundaries with myself if I'm managing the other person? Um, versus asking, you know, how do I best be a helpmate for you? It ends up being a conversation of, well, first of all, what is it that you feel like you want or need to say? And then how do we say it in a way that is honest, but also kind, right? Anytime we bring in kindness into the conversation, it really reduces the likelihood that we're going to be aggressive or that we're going to be unkind to ourselves by abandoning ourselves and not saying anything at all. So the, the place that we actually want to land whenever possible is being assertive. Assertive is I have the right to my thoughts, feelings, and opinions, and I have the right to express those again in kindness. Um, I also have the right to ask you to change behavior if it's destructive towards me, and so do you. You have those rights too. So in every marriage, both of you have the right to your thoughts, feelings, opinions. Um, you have the right to ask the other person to change their behavior if it's destructive, it includes with your kids, guys, if it's destructive. Um, and when we pair it with kindness, um, it's always more likely to land you in the middle in an assertive place. So assertiveness is healthy. Assertiveness is the goal. So when we're talking about managing and trying to stop managing other people's behavior, um, what we want to do is be assertive, right? So let's go back to those stereotypes really quick. So if your spouse is coming home and they're being irritable and they have a really rough um, situation happening at work, um, again, if they're coming home for the first time or even the fifth time, if they're coming home, sometimes those seasons are really rough, right? But if they're coming home and they're saying, you know, they're irritable and they're saying that they're really having a rough time, I would encourage you to ask the question, how can I best serve you? I see that you're having a very difficult time at work during the season right now. Um, you've been really short. Obviously, this is bothering you. Who can I best be for you right now? Or how can I best help you through this season? And if they give you a way to serve back, then um, talk about whether or not that's realistic. Talk about how you can best provide that. Um, hopefully, you're also able to have that conversation in a reciprocal way where you are giving the um, give them, giving them ideas of how they can best serve you but that would be an example of being a helpmate um if you're finding yourself in a place of managing them and you're walking on eggshells and you don't want them to lose their temper or have an outburst um, this is one of those times where you have to figure out do I set boundaries with myself or do I set boundaries with them so it can be in kindness boundaries don't always have to cause conflict and they don't always have to be mean so it can be something like hey um 
I've noticed that for a while now, you've been really having a difficult time at work and you're really struggling with being stressed out lately. And I'm finding myself changing my behavior and changing my mood so that I don't upset you. And that's, I'm finding myself getting worn out and I think I'm doing it to myself, but I need to um, be a little bit more authentic around you, or we need to figure out how to do this dance where I'm not afraid of upsetting you um, because of this difficult season. So what can we do um, to help you during this difficult season? There's the helpmate language. Um, but at the same time, I need to let you know that I need to stop managing you. And I'm rec recognizing that I do that. I start trying to manage your behavior or manage your mood. And that's not fair to you. And I'm going to try to do something different. And so that is a way that we can um, serve our spouse and hold ourselves accountable to managing. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a couple of ideas, maybe a little bit of language that you can use in your relationships. If you are thinking about your kids, obviously talking to a toddler is different than talking to a teenager, right? If I was talking to a toddler, I think I probably would manage a little bit more within myself and make some decisions. I, I use the terminology, you know, make some decisions within my own skin. And I guess what I mean by that is, what is my body feeling? What is my mind and my heart feeling? Am I feeling unsafe emotionally? So for example, I don't mean like unsafe, like um, physically or like in an abusively situation, abusive situation, unsafe, but just, you know, that discernment feeling that you get in your skin where I just, something's not congruent. I guess that's a better way to say it is that there's an incongruence between what I'm feeling on the inside versus what I'm showing on the outside. Anytime we have incongruence within us, we're not going to last for very long living incongruent with ourselves. And so when you find yourself acting one way outside, but feeling inside another way, I call that kind of, how am I feeling in my own skin? Like, how do I get back into my body, back into being aware of what my body is trying to tell me that something's off, like I'm not being authentic, that's kind of like a red flag for me to kind of pause for a minute, sit back and ask myself, what's going on here? Um, what am I maybe needing to say that I haven't said out loud? And then how do I actually, you know, is it the right time to have that conversation or when is the right time to have that conversation? And then what are the words that I need to find in order to be authentic and congruent with myself and also speak assertively and with kindness towards that other person that honors them, but it is also being congruent within myself and honoring me. And if I'm speaking to a toddler, I'm probably going to more so just figure out how to parent in a more congruent manner. So um, maybe I'm not going to maybe allow myself or try to catch myself when I am, you know, walking on eggshells and remind myself that I am the parent, I can confidently parent um, and teach my child how to behave more appropriately or how do I help them manage their emotions so that I'm not adjusting to them necessarily all the time. There are moments for that, but so that this is not becoming a habit. Um, and so it's really more so managing yourself, if you want to say it that way. If you're working with a teenager, this is where we can practice and model that congruence more openly. And I think that teaches them healthy relationship building, teaches them how to handle conflict. Um, it's like holding a mirror up to their behavior and showing them how their behavior impacts other people around them. So I would almost use similar language with a teenager as I would with your spouse or with an adult. So saying to your teenager, I know that we've been having a hard time lately. I know that we're struggling in our relationship and I really want to work on that. Um, I find myself walking on eggshells. I'm afraid to upset you. Notice how I'm using I language there, right? So instead of me saying you, 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 or you make me feel, right? Instead, I'm owning my own feelings. I'm owning my own choices and my own behavior um, that really I'm trying to take control of what's happening in me and own my behavior by being more congruent. So 
I am noticing that I am walking on eggshells more than I probably need to or more than is helpful for our relationship. And so I just want to let you know that I'm uncomfortable with how many explosive arguments we're having, or I'm uncomfortable or I'm afraid. Just be honest with it. I'm afraid of setting you off. And I want you to be able to have emotions. I want you to be able to be allowed to have a reaction or to express your emotions. But there are some ways, there are some extremes of expressing your emotion that's not okay. It's not okay for me. Um, So we need to figure out together how you can express your emotions. um, And I need to figure out how do I handle emotions that you're expressing that are maybe stronger than I am comfortable with, but are probably okay. Um, But if it's something that's not okay, I need to be able to tell you that it's not okay and us figure it out together. And sometimes that's going to be you telling me that you are needing to have this emotion and me realizing that it's not destructive. And other times it's probably going to be me saying, this is destructive. I need to ask you to change your behavior, that this is not okay for us to, to live in a household that's this disruptive, right? But the big thing is that I want to have a better relationship with you. And I recognize that I might be inhibiting us from having a healthier relationship because I'm hiding a part of myself rather than being honest and authentic that to say I'm struggling with this, right? So I hope this makes sense. I hope it's helpful. Um, This is just the beginning. So if it's a little bit blurry to you, and um, I would just encourage you to think on it, look for it in your life, um, practice. um, Those of you who are thinking about your marriage, that maybe there's a lot of managing each other that's happening in your marriage, Um, You can practice this with your kids, right? So for example, I gave um, one person I'm working with the example of practice with your kids. So like if you're managing your spouse, there's a good chance you're probably managing your kids too. (laughs) And so there's little things that you don't even have to tell anybody that you're working on. Um, But if you are, let's say, um, protecting your spouse from the kids, right? Like if the kids are really loud and, or if the kids are struggling with your spouse's behavior, right? If they're sensing your spouse's irritability, for example, and you are like managing the kids so that they don't, Um, upset your spouse, right? Or if you are managing your kid's relationship with your spouse, you can practice this by whenever your kids come to you about your spouse, you can redirect them and say, you know what? You're bringing up a really great point. It sounds like you need to go talk to your mom about that. Or it sounds like you need to go talk to your dad about that. That redirects them. It keeps you from managing that relationship. And it reminds them and teaches them that that's something that they can own and that they can practice like they need to developing that healthy relationship with that other parent. So that's a small way that you can practice kind of recognizing when you find yourself managing, practicing how to set those healthy boundaries within yourself um, so that when you have some of the other harder conversations, you can have them. But again, I think it's not as hard of a conversation if it's something that you are taking ownership within yourself and, um, and changing within yourself. I mean, it really is true. We only have control of ourselves more than anything else. So if we want to change patterns that are happening in our relationships or in our home, it starts with changing yourself and that can start a new healthier pattern. So I hope that that helps. You're going to hear um, in my interviews with um, the guests coming up, you might hear me bring up questions about managing your spouse. I know I definitely talk with Dr. Seitzma about it, so you're going to hear that as it relates to intimacy. Um, But I'm super excited for the, the launch of season eight, and I'm super excited to have you back. Thank you for subscribing and for listening. Um, Thank you for sharing the podcast with other people. I really, really depend on word of mouth. Um, I'm not a salesy person. I don't have strengths in sales. And so um, I'm a relationship builder, and I love that about myself, and I'm okay with that. And so I really depend on building a relationship with you, and that if this is something that's valuable to you, then you'll share it with other people that you think about when you're listening. So thanks for listening and um, stay tuned for the next episode coming out on May 1st with John D. Feldham. Have a great day. 
Thank you for listening to the Life Giver Podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast or leave a review so others can find it as well. Were you thinking of someone else who would benefit from hearing today's episode? You can be a life giver to them by simply sharing it with an encouraging note. If you'd like to connect with me or find out more about my work, you can visit www.coryweathers.com.